In this video, I have another engineer task, or at least engineer intel. It's going to be on Soviet Russian Palm Z minefields. The reason I'm doing this video is we had training as a unit yesterday. I did incorporate a row of Palm Z styled mines in the training in the path that the patrol moved through. I set it up as close to Russian Soviet doctrine as I could. I got enough information from my research that I figure I can do a decent video here explaining uh, how these minefields were set up, what their dimensions were, and so forth. I do have the emplacement procedures that was recommended for Soviet troops, which would have been adopted by Russian troops for these minefields. I'm getting this information from a manual from the U.S. military that was translated and distributed back in 1965. I will try to find the link to that manual and put it in the description of this video so that you can go through and research it more should you so choose. I did do a video on the Palm Z series mines. I will also put a link to that video in the description also. Now I will throw out there the shameless plug because I used a lot of tripwire putting in that uh, roll for that minefield for the unit to find. That type of stuff is paid for with donations which I get through Patreon. There will be the link as always in the description to the Patreon channel. Come over there. You know, become a patron, kick me a buck or two or five or whatever you so choose. I got a lot of tripwire I got to replace. I also have the backup channel over on BitChute. Uh, go over, bookmark that, subscribe to that because who knows, whenever YouTube may kick me off along with the other patriots, they've threatened it many times. Well, if YouTube does that, I will still upload videos over on BitChute as long as I can. Now we'll jump back into the task, the intel here. According to Soviet and later Russian doctrine, anti-personnel minefields, the rear row is supposed to be a minimum of 10 meters in front of their defensive works in front of their trenches, their bunkers, machine gun positions, anti-tank positions, whatever the forwardmost element of their defense may be. Now, on your first row here, your alpha row of a minefield according to US doctrine, it is supposed to be located 10 to 25, 10 to 20 meters in front of the row behind it. So under US doctrine, this is your alpha row, this is your bravo row. Your alpha row is 10 to 20 meters in front of the bravo row. The bravo row would be 10 to 20 meters in front of the Charlie, in front of the Delta, and so forth going back. From what I could find under doctrine, at least back in the early 60s, anti-personnel minefields were supposed to be typically one to two rows but you could expect that some of them would be have more depth to them, so it would be more than two rows. Depending on the availability of materials, the number of enemy that was expected to charge forward, and the amount of time they had to prepare their defense. Obviously, if they were fighting Chinese troops, they're going to have more rows of anti-personnel mines in front of their trenches compared to if they're fighting NATO forces they would probably have just the one to two as their protected minefield in front of their defenses. I'll make this note. I do not know if they would put a uh, wire fence in front of their trenches between the trenches and the mines. I know that under Soviet doctrine, complex obstacles, mixtures of different types of obstacles were discouraged where under NATO and especially U.S. doctrine, complex obstacles are the standard. You don't just put in wire or mines, you put in wire and mines. You don't just put in an anti-tank ditch or an anti-tank berm, you put in an anti-tank ditch with an anti-tank berm. 
Now in our current layout here, the enemy, which would be us, NATO forces, or US forces if it's a Russian minefield, we're up here, defending forces are back here. We have two rows, an Alpha and a Bravo. We have 10 to 20 meters between the two rows. The Bravo row is a minimum of 10 meters in the front of the trench line. The mines laid out are separated by 10 meters mine to mine. And then each mine has an eight meter tripwire behind it, four meters going to either side of the mine. So we have a lane here between the stakes, between the mines here, of two meters wide. The reason they do 10 meters is to prevent damage to the other mine and to prevent sympathetic detonation where one mine goes off, it sets off the next one close to it. You have similar type of spacings under all armies that use mines. You have to have a set distance between mines so it doesn't set off the one next to it. I do not know on this, I will cover this quick. The Bravo row, I couldn't find any reference on this, but I have a feeling because you have this two meter gap here, your Bravo row will probably start two meters over so that you have a continuous line of tripwire to the front. So if the enemy does somehow patrol through, goes right between that gap, they'll still hit the tripwire on the Bravo row. Now, some of the technical details on the mines itself, on its placement. The bottom of the mine head, because the mines are two-piece, actually four-piece, you have the stake, the mine body, the explosive charge, and the fuse. The bottom of the mine body is four to six centimeters above the ground. I know from photos and studying for in Bosnia, you could see those mine heads a foot to, two, to a foot and a half above ground. Those taller uh, setups were typically done in taller grass. Now the stakes, the wire stakes that are on the end here, or wire pegs as they call them in the manual, those were supposed to be a max of 10 to 15 centimeters above the ground, the top of the stake to the top of the ground. But, like in Yugoslavia, if you got the, the mine is higher off the ground, your stakes are going to be higher up also because you're stringing, stringing your tripwire higher. Now, how they laid them out, they had the mine was closer to the enemy and the tripwire was closer to the friendly lines. So they had their 8 meter tripwire, they then had a little branch line which was from what I can read and find out, it sounds like these trip wires were pre-made. And in the middle of them, you had this little branch line. And then the mine was located in front of this trip wire at the end of this branch line. On the end of the branch line, there was a quick snap hook, it said in the manual, that would be quickly attached into the pole ring on the mine, on its fuse. Now the laying, the emplacement party, and I'll give you the steps for one row. It is four personnel. The number one and number two man each have a bag with 10 to 15 mines and the appropriate number of stakes that are required. So anywhere from 10 to 30 stakes. They would also have what's called a mine cord or a guideline. They would also have the number three man. He has the tripwire required for each of the mines and would also carry an ax or a hammer to put the stakes in. The number four man is gonna be a more experienced one. He carries the fuses, a shovel if they're putting in some type of uh, in-ground mine like an OZM series bouncing Betty or a uh, blast type mine like a PMN series. He also collects up the safety pins. Now, how the emplacement procedure went. 
The number one, number two man went to the start of where their row is supposed to be. They know where the start point is, know where the end point is. They then strung out the mine cord going out, making their way towards that end point. They go down and they start putting in the mines at each location. On the cord it was pre-marked saying, you know, mine is supposed to be here. It said it was supposed to be a ring on the uh, mine cord. So at that location for each ring, they would leave the mine in the appropriate number of stakes. And then they would move down to the next mark and do the same thing all the way down until all the mines are out. According to the manual from the 60s, and I don't really think this was a safe thing, but it's the Russians, who knows. Once they get all the mines laid out, the number one, number two man reeled in the mine cord and then moved on to the next position. It could be another row farther back or it could be another minefield or the, you know, the next minefield over in the belt. Once they get the mine cord out of the way, it sounded like, according to the battle drill, that's when the number three man comes in and he starts laying from your Alpha 1 going to your Alpha 2. He first puts in the two peg, uh, wire pegs, as they call it in the manual, the wire stakes. He then stretches the, the trip wire going between the two. And it's supposed to be slightly loose, just a little bit of slack. You don't want it too taut. Then at the center where that branch line is, at the end of the branch line, puts in the mine stake or mine peg. He then moves on to the next mine and repeats the same procedure going all the way down. The number four man comes in after number three man leaves. He then puts on the head of the mine on the, the mine stake. He then inserts the fuse or screws it in if it's a Palm 2 series. Make sure that the pole ring is facing their friendly troops away from the enemy. He then attaches the, the quick hook onto the pole ring on the fuse. Then removes the safety pin from the fuse arming the mine puts that pin inside a pocket or inside a bag, moves on to the next mine, repeats the procedure. Now, if any adjustments had to be made to the trip wire before he attached, to the, attached it to the fuse, he would do those adjustments and then he would go through and attach the trip wire to the mine. Number three man is constantly getting pushed forward by number four staying at least one mine ahead, preferably two. Now, your Bravo row or the next row behind them closer to the friendly side, their arming team, their number three, number four man had to stay a minimum of 20 to 25 meters back from the arming team the emplacement and arming team in the end, the row closest to the enemy. So that means when the number four man is up here to the third mine, that means number three man starts out on their first mine in the next row. And they both just keep repeating the procedure. Alpha row finishes first, then the Bravo, and so forth going back. Now, I do mention this, a difference between this and U.S. doctrine on the tripwires. Under Russian doctrine, this is loose. The troop comes in, hits the tripwire, pulls it a fraction of an inch. It's not going to be much. It'll be an inch, max of two. That pulls the uh, fuse on the mine. The mine is going to be right next to the troop or behind them. Depending on how fast they're moving, the mine goes off. Under U.S. doctrine, for tripwires with primarily the M16 series, the M16, M16A1 bouncing Bettys, you have the mine is closest to the friendly troops and the stakes for the mines that the tripwire attached to are closest to the enemy. 
And instead of going straight to the left and right, like under Russian doctrine, under US and potentially NATO doctrine, you put it in at a V. It's each leg of the V is roughly at a 45 degree angle to the fuse. It's two separate trip wires, one going from this stake back to where the fuse is, one going from this stake back to the fuse. You do not use one continuous trip wire. That's a safety thing so that you don't accidentally pull the pole ring on the fuse of that mine, potentially setting it off. The fuses on M16s are touchy, to put it mildly. That's one of the reasons why you have two separate trip wires. Under the Russian doctrine here, you have the, the uh, wire goes approximately four meters out to each side of the mine. Under US doctrine, if I remember correctly, the max of this trip wire is supposed to be five to 10 meters because this is essentially just a hand grenade. This is actually a bursting charge, which is designed to go off, jumps up two meters up from the ground, and then detonates, so it's gonna cover a wider area. Now, you can emplace the Palm Z mines, instead of doing this basically double step stake method, you can emplace them with single stake. You have the mine, and then a the trip wire going to the stake. Doctrinally, something like that is done on lanes where the enemy is constricted, they're funneled into traveling down. So we have the mine off to the side, stake on the other side, trip wire going through, the enemy comes through, hits the trip wire, sets off the mine. In Yugoslavia, in Bosnia, we did get intel reports on this where they would take two mines put one on each side of the trail. The fuses on them were either going to be a pull fuse, like in this minefield, or a tension release. Depends on the fuse that what they had available. You would have the double mine method like this. Remember, this is you had the 10 meter separation here. So you'd have a gap that's a little bit wider than a a trail, say you're covering an alley, you put a mine on each side, the tripwire going across. They come through, you hit that tripwire, you get a mine going on each side so that you get that nice arc converging in the middle here, making sure to catch whoever's within that blast radius. Hopefully this gives you some intel uh, on what to look for. Should a, uh, you ever have to engage a force that's using Russian doctrine? Or if you're a guerrilla force and you're manufacturing Palm Zs and you're trying to put in, you're covering a wider area, you're putting in a set rural minefield, this gives you a little bit of an idea on how it was recommended these were supposed to be in place. The distances and also the procedures on how they were put in. Now, there was a second method for emplacing these mines if this position was under enemy observation, so NATO observation. In that case, this was done at night. They would string the mine cord going across the defense here, and then on each ring or each mark, you had a person along with the mine, the stakes, the tripwire, the fuse, and a hammer or an ax. They had a rope attached to them, and then they would move forward to the end of that rope. They knew to put the mine there, and then they put in the stakes to either side, attach a tripwire, put the mine in, and then they would come back. And then once everyone was done with getting the first row in, they shortened up those ropes, went in, adjusted if needed, put in the next rope. Once it, that row was put in, everyone had, had come back, they put in an extra row and an extra row. The people that were moving forward to put in those mines would go forward on a low crawl or a high crawl, staying out of observation as much as possible. Stake mines especially are still issued in the Russian army, primarily the Palm Z2M or Palm Z2 Mike an improved version. Uh, from my understanding, 
the, the, they still are following the Soviet doctrine of issuing two mines per infantryman or per engineer going into the field. So that soldier is carrying either two Palm Zs or two PMN2 series. If they're engineers, they're carrying two OZM, I think it's 72s is what they're primarily using right now. Those mines are put in primarily at night around the perimeter if they're inside enemy territory. Those hasty minefields won't necessarily be a row minefield like this. In that situation, they're putting them in. They could put them in like this, or they could put them in with a single tripwire, and they're putting across the likely enemy route of infiltration or attack to on that perimeter. It is very common, even now, that Russian troops, the next morning, they wake up, they're lazy, they'll leave the mine out there, they won't mark it, it's still alive in the ground, and then when they're asked later where their mine is, oops, I forgot it, I left it back at the last position. And they just call to get more mines delivered out to the troops to use for that night. Hopefully this helps you out, gives you some idea on how this is done. Hopefully you don't have to actually do this in the future, but if you do, here's some basic info for you. Now for all my engineer brothers in the Patriot and Militia movements, always remember, essay ons.